thank you everyone and uh, welcome to uh, the session on AI in smart cities and surveillance. Um, this is one of uh, many of our sessions uh, at this COMEX AI conference and one of the very important ones now with the uh, increased um, uptake and investment into smart cities globally, uh, which also features in the uh, Oman 2040 vision. So we welcome all of our uh, speakers here, the panel and all of our delegates uh, to this session, uh, where we'll be hearing from uh, some of the experts when it comes to AI in this topic. Uh, the speakers will go through their respective uh, speeches, at which point we will go to the Q&A section after the talk. Uh, just so everyone knows, this session is recorded and uh, it will be shared uh, throughout all our networks in the upcoming days. So uh, welcome again, and I'd like to uh, call on the chair, Dr. Uh, Ivan, uh, uh, Dr. Ivan Tankoyo, who is a chief data officer and co-founder of AI Superior, based in, um, in Berlin, Germany. Thank you, Amar. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to talk uh, on, on smart cities and surveillance topic and the AI importance in it. So. If you allow, I will share the screen. Um, all right. Do you see the slides? Sorry, yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very much for COMEX organizers uh, to, for inviting me here. So I'm Ivan Tankoyo, co-founder and managing director, uh, chief data officer at AI Superior. AI Superior is a um, company uh, solution provider for uh, large enterprises and uh, small enterprises uh, that uh, provides uh, enables AI and uh, develop software, custom software solutions. So uh, today's um, presentation of mine would be focused uh, um, mainly on two parts related to smart cities and survival. It's, uh, uh, it's basically um, separated by data modalities. So it's a video and satellite and the aerial image data. So I will start from definition of smart city. What is smart city uh, in general, the concept? Uh, and smart city is a way to make a city a comfortable place to live and work in a cost-efficient way. So essentially, optimize, uh, maximize the happiness of citizens, uh, minimizing the cost of uh, reaching it. So the focus area uh, of smart cities are quite broad. So it's uh, urban services and e-governance security, uh, behavioral analysis of citizens and crime detection, efficient resource management, for example, water, electricity, uh, waste management, heating, and so on. Transportation uh, and the urban, mo urban mobility, uh, and finally, urban planning. So these are the uh, most prominent areas, but of course there are much more. So in terms of data, uh, data modalities, right? So we have a quite a broad, uh, yeah, quite a broad number of sensors and number of types of data uh, relevant to smart cities. First of all, it's video from uh, survival lens cameras, right? So then satellite and aerial image data, which I think from my perspective uh, is a bit uh, underestimated in this topic. Uh, environmental sensors, uh, IoT, right? So it can be a uh, noise, which allows us to detect noise level, air pollution, uh, temperature, and so on and so forth. Uh, then uh, you definitely have a date on resource consumption, like, uh, um, yeah, amount of uh, lead, uh, water, uh, amount of water uh, uh, consumed by people, um, electricity and so on, statistics and demographics. And finally, social signal, right? So it's actually the uh, data stream which comes from social media, like, uh, um, or uh, from, from sit claims of citizens, right? If they are happy with something or if they are happy, uh, then they share. As the spots in the city uh, in, in through the media like images or textual. 
So I will start from satellite and the aerial image data for smart city and um, uh, would uh, briefly tell you about the advances in this area. So uh, basically, uh, a few a decade ago, it would be hard to get the data uh, in a in an easy way, and uh, the data would be quite low quality. I mean, in comparison to to the current days. So the ground sampling distance, which is actually a amount of uh, the, the size of the pixels, right, which correspond to the real um, distance is uh, starts from 0 0.4 meters. So the, the it's, I'm talking here about the satellite imagery, right? For aerial, it's, it's much more lower, but in general, so from satellites, you can, uh, you can um, get the pixels uh, with a 40 to 40 centimeter uh, size. Uh, and then uh, temporal resolution is also an important aspect. Uh, so how often a satellite uh, uh, satellite is able to, uh, to make the image of a particular area. So for free resources, it's two to five days. For the resources, uh, uh, I mean, for if you would like to buy this data, it would be even uh, lower resolution, temp temporal resolution. So uh, in terms of usage, right? So how this can be used? So definitely it can be used for infra infrastructure monitoring, right? So the, the uh, bridges, the buildings uh, and so on and so forth. So for example, uh, um, uh, some satellites provide the analysis or let's say the, the uh, radars which penetrate the building, they can provide the information about uh, severity of, uh, yeah, uh, about the uh, maintenance of this uh, bridge or building. So to predict when you would need to have some uh, required maintenance for the infrastructure. Then uh, um, it can be used for analysis of recreational zones, right? For detecting of, for parks and green zones, analyzing the stressed grass, for example, or uh, dying trees. So this is also uh, important to, for, for the city authorities. Litter detection, it's more relevant to the coastal areas, right? So which uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 waste, uh, uh, plastic waste, which comes from the sea and this should be uh, detected properly in advance and then uh, removed. Uh, finally, and then uh, there is a detection of un unauthorized construction sites, right? So you can detect that some uh, constructions are done without a legal approval of it. Car, car parking analysis, so and, uh, in, uh, in combination with the geo-informational system and you, you can understand the demand and supply and then build proper, uh, mm, yeah, provide the parkings where it's uh, a lack of infrastructure, when there is a lack of infra infrastructure for it. And finally, it can be done for urban mm, development planning. So uh, you can predict or you can actually plan in advance where the city should move based on the historical data and based on the current state of the infrastructure and the uh, demand. Uh, so, here I'd like to cover some prominent use cases for uh, satellite imagery. So one of the prominent use cases is uh, 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 detecting of water leak, right, from uh, the underground um, uh, underground pipes, uh, which seems to be yeah quite uh, yeah fantastic. Uh, but essentially, there is a technology which does this. It, it penetrates underground uh, with a waves and then you can detect uh, uh, based on the uh, based on the uh, signature pattern you can detect that there is a uh, um, water leak or and then it's actually agnostic to pipes material and also soil type so uh, there is a company which did this analysis and uh, it covers the 6000 kilometers of pipe pipes within 79 seven, nine days and detect uh, almost 700 leaks. So with a pretty high accuracy and 90% of accuracy. And this is uh, one of the um, use case where you can use 
uh, the satellite imagery and um, AI in order to uh, properly manage the uh, resources, right? So in this case, it's the water resources. Um, then uh, another use case is uh, uh, detection of uh, stress grass versus health grass. So this would help to understand to the authorities that there are some issue on these recreational zones. Um, and uh, in general, so it can also allow us to detect the parkings and different uh, set of objects. So you can see this list of objects, it's uh, more than 20 classes. So this is a proprietary technology of AI superior and uh, we uh, were able to detect uh, with 80% of accuracy different, uh, different objects on the map, including the cars, trains, uh, buildings, yeah, stress grass, as I said, and the uh, healthy grass, which is important information for the uh, for the uh, city authorities, which are responsible for it. Um, finally, uh, uh, it's a pollution detection, right? So I mentioned in the previous slide about the um, about the um, detection of garbage on the coastal areas, right, which comes from the sea. Um, and then uh, also oil spillage detection, which is quite dangerous for the uh, environment. Um, so this detector uh, works with 80%, 85% of accuracy. Currently, it's a state-of-the-art detector. So uh, this actually works both with the satellite imagery uh, as well as with um, uh, uh, with airborne, so images from drone, right? So. Um, moving forward, I'd like to also cover the topic of surveillance and traffic analysis with AI. So uh, what we developed is a, a pipeline, actually a system uh, which covers the um, uh, following pipeline. So it's detect objects on the road, it tracks them, and it's finally classifies them. So in terms of object detection, so we, we detect the traffic related entities. Um, uh, from video footage and the video is uh, uh, video footage is agnostic to the devices it was captured so so you can see some images uh, or videos in the in, in the next slides which are captured by mobile phone device right so it's not necessarily uh, cameras or cam uh, cctv cameras so uh, the video footage can be uh, taken by, by any device and then what it enables is the detection of object types and uh, objects and their types. For example, uh, to, in order to prevent uh, mm -hmm. unauthorized driving on some bus lines, for example, right, uh, where the simple cars or, or uh, motorcycles cannot be uh, uh, cannot use. So object for object tracking, it's also important uh, thing. So with object tracking, you would be able to identify and uh, classify the behavior behavior of driving, right? So behavior behavior of driver, um, whether it's a risky driver or it's a normal driver, uh, speed, and then also the uh, crossing the solid lines. It's something which allows to um, to uh, be able, uh, which is something which is detectable with this technology. And finally, object classification. Object classification allows to further extract the uh, insights about the detected object. So you are not only able to detect about the car and the buses, but you can also say whether it's a, a specific model and brand of the car, right? Why it's needed, I'll tell, I'll cover in the future. For example, in Europe, you would not be able to come into the city center in some in some European cent uh, cities. You would not be able to come in city centers if your car is not electrical vehicle, right? So there are some restrictions. And then with the car brand and the, uh, and the model, you would be able to detect what type of car is it and uh, allow to enter to some restricted places in the city. Um, so, all right, uh, on object detection um, and tracking, so we are able to achieve a real-time performance. Uh, of course, it depends on the hardware, but in general, the real-time performance is achievable up to 30 
uh, frame per second with a very high detection accuracy. So the technology employs a state-of-the-art deep learning solution and it's quite flexible in terms of architecture. So as I said, it's uh, agnostic to devices. So it can be run on the premises, on the edge uh, uh, or in the cloud. So as, um, so these are the set of the detected objects. Um, the object which we are able to detect, it's uh, people, bicycles, motorcycle, car, buses, and trucks. Um, and uh, the main application is a uh, traffic type and intensity analysis, anomaly detection, again, for example, pedestrian on a highway, and further analysis uh, of uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, of drivers. So, uh, going forward, so uh, for road object detection, uh, we have uh, pretty high uh, accuracy for the classification task. So the classification task, uh, the classification model uh, contains 7,000 car models. It's a pre pretty heavy model, which was trained a uh, few weeks uh, and, uh, and trained on um, uh, more than 100 millions of images. So uh, therefore it's a very, uh, have a very high accuracy. Uh, it's one of the best on the market with the 83 to 92% of detection accuracy and also real time performance close to 25 frames per second. Again, it's a, a part of the architecture and it's a flexible uh, and uh, uh, good enough to be deployed on different uh, uh, hardware uh, and applications are quite different. So as I said, for example, parking control for electrical vehicles and social demographical analysis, for example, income estimation for, um, for uh, um, retail networks, right? So some retail networks can install this uh, uh, software in order to analyze what cars are parked on their parking lots. Yeah, this example uh, which shows that it works in real time. So you can see the confidence interval. You can see uh, co confidence of the model. You can see what type of the car is it, uh, model and brand. These are just few examples uh, which shows the robustness of the algorithm. I'll just go quickly over them. So we also have, we also tested it in a, a bad lighting condition and it works perfectly. Right. Um, so for road object classification, there are a set of unique features, right? So, um, uh, it's allows to um, uh, partial. It's allows to classify partially occluded cars. For example, you can see here that the car is a bit occluded by another car, and then uh, it's still detected quite well, right? Uh, there are uh, the entity detection and car model classification is uh, uh, working in parallel, and uh, uh, of course the input of the for car classification. Uh, model is an uh, uh, entity detection model and uh, uh, it allows we uh, we would be able to produce in the future the production year detection and uh, it can also uh, support recognition of commercial vehicles. So uh, where it can be used so there are uh, different scenarios like for example it's a uh, uh, security application is one of the most prominent application for this um, uh, model uh, and for this uh, system. So it's an automatic search through a huge amount of video. So if you see that the car uh, is driving from one part of the city to another part of the city, it's hard to track on different cameras. It's hard to track the car over different video footages. Uh, luckily, so the system allows to detect the 
using the color model and also the uh, the brand you can detect only the cars which are uh, uh, which are relevant to provide the search criteria so uh, then it's also of course the license plate and the car model and color car color validation right so there are some uh, fraud in terms of uh, usage of different license plate for another car uh, and this can be detected by this technology uh, pedestrian violation identification uh, and road traffic monitoring understanding what are the peak hours understanding the uh, bottlenecks in the uh, uh, on the highways and uh, as well as uh, uh, city roads so the one of the special feature is a fast search and information retrieval it really works fast and due to the um, uh, high um, flexible architecture and uh, uh, optimization to performance uh, then the, it's completely automated process it supports the multiple cameras and uh, it has a quite flexible queries in terms of time color model and others so to summarize, the CTI system uh, includes road entity detection, object tracking, right, and the trajectory estimation and behavioral analysis. So it enables also car speed uh, estimation, car color recognition, type brand, model recognition, so license plates, traffic intensity, and anomaly detection. So all this uh, allows to, yeah, provide the quite uh, um, uh, 360 degree overview on the what's going on on the traffic what kind of cars uh, where are they uh, what kind of uh, issues uh, transportation have with uh, uh, with the traffic uh, and so on so at this moment i would finish my presentation so thank you very much for your attention and i think the uh, question answering session would come at the end. All right. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation, Doctor. Uh, any questions, of course, uh, we can take them at the end. So if anyone has any questions, please write them down in the Q&A section so we can answer them later. Um, we would now like to call on our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Faisal Amir Malik, who is the CTO at uh, Huawei Enterprise Solution Sales Department, Middle East. Um, you can begin your uh, session. Okay. Uh, Salam alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my slides are visible and clear. Yes. Okay, then I'll, I will start. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity on behalf of Huawei to be part of this uh, uh, wonderful event. Uh, my uh, my topic today is around uh, the use of AI in emerging si uh, smart cities. Uh, what I'll do is I'll basically talk about because I have I've seen we have a wonderful panel there. Uh, from my perspective, I will talk more about where exactly when smart cities are being developed, where exactly the AI fits in and what is uh, the roadmap to develop these kind of uh, smart cities. Uh, I'm working as a regional CTO, I've been part of Huawei for the last uh, uh, 16 years. I've been participating in a lot of uh, these kind of country level and city level transformation uh, projects. So to start with, uh, when we look at the higher, uh, when we look, we look at the bigger picture uh, and we look at the future uh, post COVID-19 or even if COVID-19 was not there, uh, what uh, we are going to do until 2025 or 2030, how we see is that the countries uh, will be paying attention to uh, three aspects very importantly. One is uh, information infrastructure, where uh, they would be heavily investment, investing into communication infrastructure, new technology infrastructure, and enhancing their 
uh, computing power infrastructure. Uh, when we say communication, of course, we all know it's related to 5G, IoT, industrial inter uh, internet, Wi Fi 6, and things like that. New technologies, again, we are talking about things like big artificial intelligence, big data, uh, emergence of blockchain, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we have also seen in the region and globally, uh, countries and cities are enhancing their capability when it comes to developing uh, data centers, because at the end of the day, until we do not have uh, these uh, regional or country level or city level data centers, we cannot realize uh, uh, de developing smart cities. Second part is all the cities, all the countries, national programs will be heavily uh, investing and paying attention into convergence of ICT infrastructure and the real offline world and bringing them together. We saw this also in COVID-19, how we were forced to uh, converge faster when it comes to health and education infrastructure. And last but not the least, a uh, very massive investment and pay, uh, attention into uh, how we can develop human capital and how we can bring in innovation into the environments we are uh, developing. And on the right hand side, as you can see, the, we, when we talk about AI, when we talk about cloud, connectivity, big data, applications, computing, data centers, these all will be the foundation technologies of helping us uh, to achieve uh, that. Then on the other hand, we will see lots and lots of use cases. We've already seen lots of lots of use cases coming up around AI, cloud computing, and intelligent connectivity. When I say intelligent connectivity, it is uh, it can be Wi-Fi 6, it can be 5G, it can be 4G, it can be uh, IoT, anything. So when we bring them all together, we, st we have started building uh, use cases in every city in the region and cities and countries uh, around the world, for example, how uh, the speaker before me was talking about AI with video analytics. So how to bring this together, how a camera mounted on the pole is communicating, which is running an AI algorithm or maybe uh, on board or at the back end is connected through a 5G network to the back end, a cloud uh, system and how all this decision making is taking place. Same goes for uh, transportation, same goes for uh, uh, other aspects of a smart city or on a larger perspective, uh, what digit uh, digital transformation is taking place on the country level. Now, we are lucky that we are talking uh, uh, from Oman's platform where uh, it's not a country which is still planning to develop a roadmap for the future. Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, roadmap for the future that is 2040, uh, national development plan or national plan or we, and there are very clear set targets and to achieve these kind of targets from our experience and uh, from huawei we have seen that smart cities play or intelligent cities as i say now uh, play a very very important role because 70 percent of the gdp uh, countries are generating are coming from cities or i would say now smart cities and 37 of world's largest economies are actually City. So this is why when we talk about national development plans, we think uh, the emergence of smart cities or development of smart cities or intelligent cities as we talk about future is very, very important. Either we are talking about goals like smarter people, healthier people, which is now very important, smarter environment, smarter living, mobility, economy, and last but not the least and very important is smarter government. So to achieve uh, your national goals and uh, agenda or a roadmap set by the country, well, how countries are moving it forward is they are developing smart city projects. This is happening in region. We've saw, so we have seen what happens, happened in UAE. Dubai is a classical example. Uh, uh, Abu Dhabi is another example. We have seen emergence of smart city projects in Saudi to be part of Saudi Arabia's uh, 2030 goal. Same is happening in Qatar, Kuwait, and of course, Oman, uh, is also on the same uh, roadmap. So how does it happen? Like why we wanted to talk about this because uh, I will come to the technology part level, but we need to know how does it happen. From our experience of 120 plus smart city projects in, in 40 countries around the world, what we have seen is there are four very important things that need to be there to make this happen. If I either I'm talking about AI in smart city, either I'm talking about big data in smart city, 5G in smart city, the technology, te technology part comes later. But first and most important thing is the vision comes from the top. The country leadership has to drive the vision and help uh, use their uh, leadership to clear all the hurdles that come on the way, and there are a lot of hurdles, hurdles related to financing, hurdles related to regulation, hurdles related to manpower, creating teams, 
and keeping the focus. So the but it all comes from the top. And this is what we have seen from our experience globally. Second, most important thing is creating the right teams who are driving these strategies very focused and they do not let devi themselves and the plans to be deviate from what is already decided because uh, starting smart city projects, I've seen many projects starting globally and in the region, but somewhere one year down the road, the projects get derailed. Eight out of $10 as it is set is wasted because the focus was not there. The right kind of structure was not there. Then financing becomes very important part. Uh, it's not only about sufficient financing, sufficient investment, but the right understanding of when and how to put money into these kind of projects. Public-private partnerships have played a very, very important role. Dubai is, again, a very good example where the at the country level, at the city level, there were a lot of uh, projects being driven, the investment coming in, but there was a lot of public-private partnership, a lot of uh, communities being developed by the major developers in the city started playing their role. They aligned themselves with the vision of the country. And last but not the least, creating the digital ecosystem, uh, bringing in the right technology partners where even companies like us and others who are part of this event play a very, very important role. And even events like comics and these kind of discussion we are having today play a very, very important role. Then uh, talk, moving next, uh, then what do we actually create? we create digital twins. We, the new concept is that when we develop smart cities, we are actually creating the digital twin of your city where uh, either it's, it's intelligent video surveillance, either it's traffic management, your uh, logistic management, your environment management, uh, no, uh, your city management, no matter what kind of go goals you are trying to achieve, uh, technology helps you collect all the data, all the information, AI and big data analytics, these kind of platforms help you compute and create uh, the visualization on the top. The visualization can be in the IOCs. I will show you some examples later. And now even cities are moving to new uh, ways of doing it, like using AR and VR. Uh, two years, three years ago, when I went to China, I saw an example of, for example, a lineman, uh, uh, a water uh, from a water treatment company moving uh, a water waste management company moving on the road, have wearing an AR or VR goggle, was able to see what is under the roads happening with the pipelines. So again, the, the visualization does not need to be inside the command center uh, in terms of AI and big data. The visualization can be at the edge. Every person who is manage, managing the city can be part of the visual, visualization. And on the right side, as you can see, uh, the awareness, the city managers need, the country managers need, the district managers need for their operations, the planners need, and the prediction they need to create to manage the city better in the future. So this is the result of all these technologies when we talk about AI, when we talk about cloud computing, when we talk about intelligent connectivity or big data. So those technologies are actually the driving force or the building blocks behind it. Now let's go further. What do we achieve out of it? And what are the building blocks actually when we start translating them into real sense. At the bottom, let's say one, two, three, four, till nine. At the bottom is the digital infrastructure, which is more around connectivity, or we so call intelligent connectivity, because without the right kind of network late, I, uh, telco operators in a city or a country play a very important role in uh, cities, <coughs> excuse me, would roll out their own uh, I, uh, connectivity infrastructure as well for utilities. On the top comes, as I said, public data centers, uh, government data centers, citywide data centers, because at the end of the day, all computing happens inside these data centers. So better facilities you have, better business continuity you have. On the compute level, the better cities can perform. And then comes the platform layer where IoT platform, big data platform, GIS platform, uh, integrated communication platforms, video cloud platforms, they all come here. And then on the top, you start building services. Now, services can be related to governance, uh, the, the, can be related to economy, can be related to mobility, uh, like intelligent video surveillance, smart parking, smart traffic, uh, smart logistics. Uh, 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 my colleague before me was talking more about the mobility part, then related to environment, related to people and living. So when we are actually working with cities, we always discuss the use cases. We don't go and discuss only the technology part. We say what kind of use cases you want to develop. Then everything starts falling into place. Either it's 
AI, it's big data, it's 5G, no matter what the technology is, the prime focus is what exactly the city is trying to achieve. What exactly is the business model? What exactly is the strategic goal? What exactly is the vision at the top? As I said, these things are very, very important to drive the technological infrastructure at the bottom. And then how do we achieve this maturity level? Uh, level? So it all started from the left to right. Uh, we had silos. Still, I've seen many projects, smart city projects, where uh, because of maybe the wrong planning or the wrong vision or the wrong kind of direction taken by the cities, they end up creating silos. And silo syndrome happens. They end up creating silos. They create networks. They create 20 applications, nothing talking to each other. Second part type of uh, maturity level is collaborative environment where, yes, they would have different kind of uh, agencies, uh, data platforms, data lakes, warehouses, data warehouses, GIS platforms working together, they start collaborating with each other, which is where actually most of the cities in the world are right now. But what is the next level is where we say, or I also say in such kind of uh, forums is not the smart cities, but intelligent cities where we would use the data, we would use these IoT sensors, we would use these uh, AI platforms to start predicting what can go wrong, what can go right, what is the right way of running this city, what is the right way of running our energy, what is the right way of handling our uh, pollution in the city, what is the right way of designing because, for example, cities now are looking at AI to help them plan their roads because if you keep in, uh, bringing in flyovers after flyovers, underpasses after underpasses, uh, you uh, bring in the best of even autonomous vehicles, the roads will keep getting crowded. But can we use AI? And we are working in China on a lot of use cases where AI started playing role, not in only in managing the traffic to the signal level, but started creating the digital twin of the whole city environment where the, the this digital twin can predict where exactly you need the roads, where exactly, how many tracks to be uh, added, what kind of flyover uh, you need, what kind of band in a flyover you need. So this is where the cities are uh, moving uh, forward. Then let's talk about technological part. So where does AI fit in? Where does sensors fit in? Because uh, I go to many forums where we talk about these technologies, but a lot of time people are afraid to talk or people are afraid to ask us that where exactly does this fit in, into the whole uh, environment? So at the bottom layer, you, you, so now you can see layer by layer technological uh, framework. At the bottom layer, you see all the terminals, all the sensors, they all converge uh, to the upper layer through any kind of network. The cities have to become uh, connectivity agnostic. So they need to have all kinds of networks working there. It can be wireless network, wired network, uh, networks being used by police departments, city departments, they all have to talk to each other. And on the top is the platform. So city, the platforms can be like GIS platforms, video cloud platforms, IoT platform, business uh, information platforms, 3D modeling platforms, or system level, district level, city level uh, databases. They again converge uh, to upper uh, big data uh, layer where again, we start creating applications. Now these applications, uh, can be software driven and on the top AI driven. Now these applications can be related to better management of the city, better livelihood or better economy or mobility. So here is where you start creating the AI use cases. And this all converges into centralized single intelligent operation centers where the city mayors, the city management or the sub uh, businesses of the city can create or can take their output and that is exactly where the ROI of all the investment that goes into the technology comes out. Now, let's take an example. Now, I am not, what I'm talking about is not something that is of the future. We are already practicing it. As I said, as Huawei, we are participating in 120 to 30 projects all over the world in the region. And uh, Smart City Yambu is one of those projects where why I present this project, because this project starts is was part of again 2030 vision of uh, kingdom of saudi arabia and the idea was to start creating pilot projects rather than waiting for a large project and learn from these projects what should be happening in bigger cities when we go into riyadh when we go into jeddah when we go into creating now we are creating cities like neom and we are also engaged there as a technology a digital technology partner so 
as you can see at the bottom, we decided that what will be the use cases. So Yambu is an industrial city. And so the use cases were around heavy vehicle uh, weight in motion, parking automation, intelligent light control, video surveil, uh, video, uh, video cloud, uh, waste management, uh, public Wi-Fi and analytics running on the top, uh, city performance uh, indicators, and even going down to the level of smart hole management. And all of these indicators were given right kind of KPIs, what exactly we want to achieve out of it. And we then started developing uh, the sensors layers, network layer. We, at that time, we used LTE. Uh, and now we will be transforming it to uh, 5G as we move into the future. And then, as you can see on the right side, this picture, uh, this is actually, actually where this all converges. Now, this is where the brain of the city is created. Now, this brain is working on big data and AI. And this brain can not only uh, give a complete visualization of the city, it is completely aware of what's happening in the city, but it is it now we are going to the level where we can start predicting uh, what is needed in the city in the future. What if there is a there is a certain kind of uh, accident, certain kind of calamity, uh, God forbid. So how to handle this calamity? How certain functions of the city can start taking decision by themselves, start gathering resources, start call calling the right people, start dispatching the uh, maybe right kind of uh, vehicles to the drones or anything that is needed to handle uh, the situation. Yambu Smart City Project, because of its perfect kind of development model, also re received a Smart City Award in Barcelona at the Smart City Global Forum, which is very esteemed forum that happens every year. Uh, so this is a very, very good example how uh, we can put in not only the sensor layer, the network layer, but on the top AI and big data layer to the right use and not limit ourselves to one or two or three kind of use cases because all these use cases, either uh, we are talking about videos, uh, video analytics, video cloud, we are talking about how to handle sensors, we are talking about anything. They all converge to a bigger purpose that it should all make sense uh, to the management of the city, the people who are actually doing or putting investment uh, into the technology. So the, the, I have summarized all of this conversation into these steps. So how does it happen? Step number one, top level design. And as we say, city has an urban planning development plan. We need to develop a technological uh, development plan for the city, step number one. Step number two, business model. Now, business model is not always about money. Business model is about the ROI. Now, I'll I showed you the kind of ROIs and KPIs designed for Yambu. What kind of ROIs needed to be uh, created out of this model? Step number three is where the coordinated planning, phase construction, technology part, everything happens. And step number four is where the digital partners like us as Huawei, we come in whereas we guide the customer through all of these steps but we play a very very important role here where all the tools platforms technology ai big data all of these things uh, come in and last but not the least also we need to plan successful operation uh, of these things because if you create a very complex environment you have not taken care of the human capital development which will manage the city there is no use i have city, seen a lot of smart cities and safe city projects where uh, hundreds of millions of, do of dollars were uh, invested, but there was actually no one later on to run the command centers of the city. So where we have worked with the customers around the world, we have created academies into these command centers. We have created a, a roadmap for human capital development. Uh, keep training the people who come into these uh, smart city or safe city projects. And so this is part of the sustainability or legacy uh, of these uh, smart city or safe city or overall smart city uh, projects. So this was all uh, from my side. What I tried to focus, as I said, was not only going into one aspect of what exactly smart city is, but try to show the audience that when we talk about AI, when we talk about big data, when we talk about the use cases of all these things, either from sensors, video surveillance, 5G connectivity, uh, people and ana analytics, footfall, or the bigger intelligent operation centers, how these things are developed, how these things make sense and how the business or a social ROI of these things are developed and what steps are involved in planning of these cities. Thank you very much. I'm available for any kind of questions. Even at this forum, I'm available on LinkedIn. 
you are most welcome to contact me anytime. Thank you very much for being on. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Faisal, and thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Regina Relva Romano. Uh, she is from Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, head of Smart City uh, Foundation Dom Cabral. Uh, sorry, Dr. Ivan, uh, I am not able to see Regina in the panel list. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think she's not yet joined in. All right, so let's so then we can move on to our next speaker then. Um, uh, Ivan, you can, you can introduce uh, John, uh, John Griffiths. John Griffiths is a Chief Technical Officer of Secure Sensor Innovative Design from Cardiff, United Kingdom. Welcome. Hi, uh, good morning and thank you very much for asking me to present at uh, Comex AI. <clears throat> I'll just share my screen if I may. Um, Hi, um, just a little bit about me. Um, my name is John Griffiths. I'm Chief Technical Officer of a company called Secure Sensor Innovative Design Limited, uh, founded in 2013. Um, in particular, it, we aim at looking at IoT and IoT devices, uh, specifically in the home, to help uh, actually pull together a smart city from a granular point of view. Um, so my background uh, for 11 years, I was chief technical uh, technology specialist for the Welsh government. And also uh, that was up until 2011. And in 2013, I founded uh, uh, Safe House, which is uh, the brand name of uh, Secure Sensor Innovative Design Limited. And um, in 2015, we were uh, finalists with our product, which is called Safe House, at Smart City Expo, uh, at which time I was, uh, I was drafted into the UK government in the Department of International Trade, where I was the technology specialist for smart cities and IoT for Asia. Um, during this period, we've been mostly looking at the idea of the citizen in the smart city and exactly how particularly the aging population means that citizens can be smart and they can live in their own homes longer. And this has huge health implications for the whole of the, uh, whole of the uh, city environment. So traditionally, uh, we've been looking at IoT to integrate health and well-being, <clears throat> both with property and uh, actually managing those properties better. And our product Safe House essentially is a, a LoRa-based environment. A LoRa is a low-power wide area network running on uh, 868 megahertz, and it allows a uh, very large rollout of sensors throughout the city to pick up information such as temperature, humidity, um, also with additional sensors such as movement and uh, other actions in the home. So essentially, unlike most systems, rather than going from the top down and looking at a smart city from there, we go granularly actually making the citizen smart, their property smart, and then using that to fuel a 3D digital twin, which effectively means that your data is in real time and can be granular, whether it be in an apartment block, whether it be in the city and working from there. Um, Safe House is used in many councils and health organizations and housing associations to monitor the wellness of the building taking into things such as humidity and temperature, but also uh, movement, loneliness, anything of that sort, and ways of predicting uh, unhealthy behavior or changements in one's behavior, which then may actually uh, address health issues. So during this period, we were asked and won, um, should I say, won a competition, which was to do with uh, Scotland in uh, something called a can-do uh, challenge and 
in the can-do challenge the main issue with people as they get old is if they're living on their own that they may actually uh, fall and nobody will actually know that they're there and, and they've fallen and this can huge cause large amounts of uh, distress and possibly even death and we were challenged with the idea of being able to not only look at the health of the person in the property and the property's health itself, but also being able to uh, actually identify using whatever method, um, smart decisions, which would basically turn around and be able to identify people if they had fallen uh, or indeed were not moving in their own properties, even though maybe nobody was visiting. And so there were some criteria relating to this. One of the criteria was that you weren't allowed to use a camera. Another part of the criteria was that you couldn't use broadband. So you had to use a LoRa um, low power wide area network. And the third, uh, third criteria was we were not allowed to use um, wearables. So this caused its own problems in that essentially if you've got a smart city and you've got an aging population, how do you know that they're actually okay in their own home? How do you know they're still there and how can you do this affordably? Um, so we saw this as using Edge AI uh, as the forefront of the health and well-being revolution where smart decisions are made on the edge and notifications are sent through uh, using very small packets to uh, major um, or large call response centers, which can then actually put personalized um, care in place for that person. Um, so basically the idea is if you could pick up the movement, body, posture, recognition and actions of an individual, then you know that they're actually okay or they're healthy in their own home. So we started using this on the basis that we would look at uh, speech to, to text and the idea of using a essentially a, an Alexa type system whereby you could actually look at somebody and they may have fallen, uh, for example, or they may have some other issue. And what would then happen is that the um, actual um, the actual person could shout safe house and they could then respond safe house would respond to them um actually saying that some, there's an ambulance on its way or somebody's uh, in somebody's actually dealing with your call and what we would do is we'd change that voice um to a sentence uh in uh, an alexa type environment using a very low cost uh, raspberry pi computer which would then produce an output which would in this case be 999 f d fall detected so you could then use the low power wide area networks the LoRa networks to actually send uh, a message back to a call center which can then be translated so in this particular case it's mrs galbraith we know how old she is uh, we know where she lives and the fact which she'd fallen over uh, needed help and the temperature in the room and what was actually asked for so we thought this is a good example of how you could basically turn Alexa into something that's slightly better than uh, than just being a um, ordering new stuff through Amazon however what we discovered uh, was that using edge AI and small processing meant that you had to customize the voice function for every individual so this was totally unacceptable you can't roll that out at scale and that <clears throat> really was a, a big stumbling block so we scrapped all that and we decided to look at edge ai uh, processing using infrared and as you can see from the screen using body postures it's quite easy to actually decide that somebody is doing something however uh, as you can also see from the screen, it's quite easy to get confused. Um, and in computing pr processing, it's very difficult to actually identify the difference between maybe a computer, if you look at the top uh, example, um, and someone's head, or indeed a coffee machine, or all of the issues with background noise associated with infrared. So in concept, it was a great idea. The snag was, how do you actually turn this into something which could go over a hundred packets, a uh, hundred uh, digit packets 
and actually identify something has happened to that individual in this smart city. So we decided to investigate this <clears throat> and here's the first of our examples. And as you can see from this, the thermal imaging, uh, obviously you can't tell the person is uh, actually a person, but most importantly, you have an awful lot of false data from the thermal imaging there, which is actually pretty difficult to identify. However, the concept was quite good in that we think that if we could refer, re, re, actually refine this in such a way, we would be able to actually have a unit sitting in somebody's home, which would not only know the temperature, the movement, but also the fact the person had fallen and then actually uh, you use um, AI at the edge to identify that and contact a call center or a loved one or relative to come back to that person. Essentially making the smart city into a place for what we call forever homes, where somebody can stay in their home for uh, much, much longer than they would be otherwise. However, using AI, we found this actually wasn't going to work either. There were too many false positives and it was too difficult. We needed to a better algorithm. And after some work, <clears throat> we managed to come up with various ways <clears throat> of filtering the information and also identifying a person moving much more accurately, completely anonymously, but at least we knew the person was doing certain functions. And we thought that had potential to go from uh, here forward. So where do we go from there? <clears throat> well, you've got a data transportation method running through LoRa. And what we did was we teamed up with uh, Glasgow University's research department for electronics. And uh, we actually looked at the idea of using our own uh, safe house to, uh, and its alarm functions to then look at the thermal uh, imaging camera, which would be an edge camera. And the whole concept of this was that the edge camera itself uh, would sit completely silently in the room and it would be able to identify a fall. Once that fall happened, then the whole concept was that you would actually be uh, almost instantaneously contacted to discover if you're okay. And bear in mind, we are also taking a lot of other information from your apartment, such as things as door opening, um, so we know if somebody's been visited, uh, we know also um, the uh, which room they're in and by using in, uh, passive infrared sensors and uh, using that information on top of the information of the fall, we can rapidly get the appropriate uh, response. And in many cases, the appropriate response is just a next door neighbour maybe to go in and see this person. So really encompassing what we call a circle of care in your smart city, being able to actually uh, in these days of isolation and internet and Zoom, but actually knowing that uh, your loved, loved ones may be just next door and uh, they could come and help rather than actually an ambulance or a paramedic. So where did we go from here? Well, we looked at this idea of the edge and thermal cameras. Uh, thermal imaging sensors and it was quite tricky to actually pull this together. Um, first of all it, it was a proof of concept so could it actually be identified as being industrialized? Uh, thermal cameras, uh, thermal imaging sensors should I say, are generally quite expensive and if it's too expensive you can't really put it in each everyone's home to check that. However um, it also needs to be reliable and that was a real big issue. Um, currently false sensors, uh, which are wearables, um, out of 1,300 people in Glasgow who have those sensors, um, in one month, it's not uncommon to have 1,030 false uh, alarms. Obviously that takes up a huge amount of resources. Um, your healthcare aspect of the city is much more different if you can you know keep sending people out and they haven't really fallen um, so it had to be first of all re reasonable cost and it also had to be reliable and industrial it also had to link with in intrinsic intrinsic um, alarm sensors and in this particular case uh, a company called Tunstall actually has the alarm center <coughs> 
And again, that meant very little upheaval. Traditional uh, telecare or care devices are very basic. They haven't changed for about 25 years. This was a complete change in how you make a smart citizen. So who can look after themselves in their own property? Um, <clears throat> we also looked at the idea of uh, preventing early hospitalization. Essentially, the quicker you can get a person uh, the care they require, the faster and more likely they are to return back to the proper property that they fell in. And this is a big issue if you can't pick up that the person has fallen over. So, the, or if in many cases, some of the sensors wait maybe 30 seconds to check that you're motionless um, if they're wearables. These are really not very suitable. So this was a complete change from the way in which you'd look at visualization of the home and how you would actually achieve that. And um, the final package was, as I said, to be a deployable phase two, which could work. So this was a very basic starting place. That is a false detector. It um, has to be industrialized. It, it really isn't that uh, friendly. But having said that, you've got to start somewhere. And that originally sat on top of the television. And you can see uh, on the side there, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back. You can see actually on there is the thermal sensor is very small. The electronics are quite large, but it would sit on top of a television, giving a huge uh, range of view and actually could then come back with some very, um, it had as an uninterrupted view it meant it could pick up the fall itself so <clears throat> what exactly does safe house ai do well this is a video that demonstrates it Now the issue you see there is one of, on the left hand side, a thermal image. Uh, the center of thermal image, which we've uh, put our AI on. And then finally the rules-based engine, which actually tells us the person has fallen. Um, that actually is incredibly difficult to do and to do it reliably. So you say you can do it once, but can you do it again? And as you can see, a person coming in at a different angle falls straight towards the TV and they fall over. So the actual picking up using AI of uh, this particular fall is instantaneous. Um, that means that that person at that point would have a voice channel, a uh, voice over IP channel opened. Uh, we know their background. Uh, we'd know if they, uh, which rooms they've been in because of uh, environmental sensors in each room. In the, uh, we'd know the temperature and, <coughs> uh, excuse me, <coughs> and ideally we'd know actually the age of the person as well. So straight away the alarm center, rather than just having somebody has pressed a button, uh, we know a lot of background to that individual. We know where they live. Uh, we know actually the um, uh, temperature and humidity in the property, as in, in the UK, that's a real issue in winter, if somebody's lying there motionless for a, a long period of time. And ideally, you can actually um, speak to the person and identify if that was a fall which was serious, or if they're shaken by it. And obviously, what this gives is confidence to the smart citizen that they're actually going to be um, uh, looked after and don't have to leave their own home. So we did six months of this in the challenge and the objective was to allow people safe in their own homes longer without using Wi-Fi cameras or wearables. And that really is quite a tall order because you haven't got many things to go on, um, unlike the previous presentations where we've seen a lot of the work is done using uh, visual aids and cameras. We weren't allowed that uh, due to privacy reasons. So as such, uh, we've actually, you know, think we've done quite a good job. Uh, Safe House AI is already under test um, and we're currently gonna, it'll be available Q4 uh, for the mass market. Um, 
it's going to really be the most cost effective way of dealing with falls. Um, falls in the United Kingdom cost the NHS uh, one billion pounds per annum. Um, the problem with a fall is that if you fall and break your hip once, uh, it costs the NHS eleven thousand uh, pounds. If you then come out of hospital after six months, you normally fall again, costing another eleven thousand pounds. And uh, then, unfortunately, your life expectancy is probably about three months on average after the second hip replacement if you live on your own. So it has a huge economic impact on the healthcare system. So we think this is uh, really the way forward in smart cities to keeping the aging population staying uh, in their own homes. Um, we also believe that uh, you can use IoT sims uh, for voice over IP for this particular reason, um, in that we don't need a GSM, or the IoT sims are GSM, they're much lower cost, and uh, we only need 200 uh, kilobits per second uh, to do a voice over IP call, and that actually only needs to be done uh, when somebody falls over. So as such, these calls are very inexpensive. Um, you know, we're talking uh, maybe um, pounds-wise, you know, one pound per year to keep the uh, device online. So much, much game cheaper and still allowing people to call and talk to that person. And um, as such, the uh, the IP has been developed in Scotland and has been patented. And uh, as I said, it's hopefully coming out Q4 this year as a product which you'll be able to buy. Um, so the final packages are we've been putting together 10 units they won't look anything like the one that you saw before these are dedicated small units uh, they use uh, bluetooth speakers so they don't even need a speaker in them uh, so they can be put very inobtrusively in that in the property um, and at a scale obviously um, using voice over ip we connect directly to the alarm center a lot quicker doesn't need la analog landlines the analog um, landlines in the united kingdom which traditionally do this job are going to be uh, switched off in 2025 so there's a huge market for that um, the speakers and microphones are all bluetooth which means that you can actually have professional devices um, which you can buy from Amazon, um, connected to Safehouse AI. Um, and we're manufacturing locally, which is always good. Um, we, uh, we're funded by the Scottish Government to do this. And as such, we are planning to actually manufacture uh, locally in the uh, what was the best of the electronic subassembly areas of the UK and Scotland. Um, IoT... Uh, really is part of the Scottish infrastructure because uh, they've actually put a LoRa network uh, which covers the entire country and as such um, these can be deployed instantly uh, anywhere in that country and using um, LoRa the, as the network and uh, what is an IoT SIM we get redundancy in getting the message back to the alarm centre meaning if one or other is down then it, the message will still get through. <coughs> we're hoping to be in uh, Mobile World Congress in 2022, as soon as it, um, it moves forwards, um, the uh, epidemic that we're currently in subsides and allows such things. And uh, we're currently talking to the NHS in England uh, about how this can impact uh, on the very large amount of money. As I said, 1 billion uh, US dollars, 1.4 billion uh, US dollars sorry um, then essentially we think this can greatly improve that but more importantly uh, goes towards the uh, UK's um, target of actually uh, five plus more years in your own home so most properties now in the UK in the smart city side of things are being built to accommodate people in their latter life and making sure they can stay there and we in their own home longer so we believe this is actually part of that and as being part of um, taking the temperature humidity the building management people also have uh, a really unique selling point in that they've got preventive maintenance uh, being able to work out if a certain apartment is um, energy inefficient, then producing too much carbon, that all is picked up by safe house and can be acted upon. Giving a carbon baseline to your property and then actually seeing what interventions make a difference to that carbon baseline um, and then working from there. So, 
So in short, um, even though a smart city is a smart city, uh, we believe smart healthcare is an integral part of that smart city. And if you can't keep people safe in their own homes, then there's actually not much point. Actually, um, you, ha you have to build smart, smart into the home to enable that. Um, we've thoroughly enjoyed this project. We think it's a really interesting area and something that we're looking forward to pushing forward and keeping the elder generation safe in their own homes and making cities which are suitable for them in the next, next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. So thank you to this very nice presentation about cost-efficient solution and the great contribution, in my opinion, to healthcare system once it's completely operational. And it's definitely a part of smart cities because uh, uh, elder care is an emerging topic in the smart cities as well. Uh, all right, uh, our next presenter, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Leila al hat -Hrami. Uh, she is a director of Smart City Awareness Center of Ministry of Transport, Communication and the Information Technology of Oman. Welcome, Leila. And, uh, Leila, sorry, you're, you're currently on mute. Thanks for that. Okay. Welcome, Leila. Okay, let me share my screen with you. Is it clear now with all of you? Uh, yes, it says it's, uh, yes, now it's showing. Okay, let me. Okay. It's really my pleasure to join you all today and listening to all the speakers to speak about, you know, the different models in smart cities and different solutions. What I'm going to talk today about is a little bit different from my colleagues, but they are supporting what I'm going to speak about it. I'm going to speak about the smart cities as a project in Oman. So when it comes to Oman smart cities uh, progress, uh, when it really started in Oman, it started as a first phase on 2017, because in 2017, we started as smart city platform. At that time, smart city platform, it was a strategic program under the research council in collaboration with three more uh, organizations. And they were uh, ITA, Muscat Municipality, and the Supreme Council. And it was funded by uh, the private sector with three organizations, three companies, uh, Oman Tel, Umran, and Dama. Uh, alhamdulillah, with that time, you know, it was like a big focus. Uh, we need to, you know, to let people to know what is smart cities, because when it comes to the smart cities, is this just about the technology or is it something else? So uh, during that time, we have different building capacity, we have different hackathons, we engage with different stakeholders, with the government, with the private sector and so on. So, and uh, not only that, even the academia were, you know, like our main stakeholders in the project. So uh, luckily we have, uh, you know, uh, created a good uh, eco about the smart cities in Oman. Everyone started, you know, asking questions, raising questions. The good uh, news about it that uh, because of that, you know, uh, impact, uh, Oman smart cities in 2021, we are becoming now as a national project. And now everyone is asking question about the second phase, smart cities, who's going to lead the smart cities? Nobody is not like a one uh, organization going to lead that uh, project because it is a national uh, project aligned with Oman 2040 vision. We need to have smart cities, smart governance in Oman. So who's our you know, uh, partners in this uh, project? Who's going to lead this project? The main uh, organization that's going to lead this project, uh, it's mainly uh, the project management is going to be led by MTCIT, Minister of Transportation, Communications and IT. And our uh, main partners is you know, Minister of Housing and Urban Planning, because when it comes to smart cities, it's not just about technology, it's about you know, a smart system where we can live in a smart city, we can feel happy. And I always say happy because why we are getting all the services that I needed as a citizen of that city. And the main partner is also the governance in Oman. We have 11 governance in Oman. Eight governance are, you know, the under uh, supervision of Minister of uh, Interior and three independent governance, Muscat, Dufar and Musandam. And of course we have like other cities like Prison cities, like Tukum Smart City, Rala, and different cities uh, at the time. 
So we have, you know, a focus on all these cities. So we can be a smart city in our mind. So who's going to be our project players? Uh, our project players going to be like five main categories. The first category, which is the government. So why we need the government sector? We need the government sector so they can, you know, support us when it comes to the policies, regulations, framework, governance, and so on. Uh, as Faisal say, we have uh, to have uh, policies and we have uh, to urban planning and so on. So you cannot do it alone. It has to be a national project, all the stakeholders, stakeholders involved in this topic. And when it comes to the private sector, we need to involve the private sector because they are the ones who are going to build our cities. They are, they are the ones who are going you know, uh, to support us. Because sometimes the smart, uh, you know, the private sector cannot succeed in some projects if the government sector have not support them. And it's the same why we need also the academia. The academia are the one who are going, you know, to have the uh, sustainable development when it comes to the research and papers. Because sometimes we are speaking about technologies, but we don't know what's the best technology that we have to use. And here, you know, the roles of the academia is coming. They will say, okay, we think this, uh, you know, technology should be implemented here or we should get this practice and so on. So we need them all to be you know, our partners. And when it comes to the SMEs, we need to empower the SMEs. Why we need to empower the SMEs? Because you are going you know, for a vision of the digital economy, which is one of the main visions of smart cities also in Oman as part of the Oman 2040 vision. How we are going to empower the SMEs? Because we are going to create jobs. Creating jobs is by you know, empowering the SMEs. Those SMEs, they are, they are the ones who are going, you know, to provide the smart solutions. They are going to be our partners in implementing, you know, the, the projects of smart cities. And when it comes to the individuals, I always consider them as the main players. Why they are the main players? Because individuals, it is about me, you, any one of us here, you know, attending this session, we are going to decide what is the smart city that we are dreaming about it. Do I need a smart city like Paris, a smart city like Barcelona, a smart city like, for example, in somewhere around the world? So it depends in the you know, requirements of each citizen. Because you know, in the past, when it comes to Oman, for example, everyone was you know, immigrating to Muscat because Muscat is the capital of Oman. So they find all the you know, uh, qualified services for them when it comes to uh, medical, medical sector, the education and the you know, uh, the job sector. It was Muscat for them is, you know, their favorite city because it is providing all the services that they are looking for. But with the current approach, we have 11 governments in Oman. The population and the urbanism is, you know, uh, increasing day by day. So people can not all of them just go now to Muscat. Everyone now wants to feel happy in their own cities. They want to get their own, you know, services. I am as a citizen, what are the best services that I'm looking for? Am I going to get, for example, jobs in my city, in my government? Does each government going to have a central city? Does each government going to be able to provide, for example, jobs aligned to his smart city? So these are a lot of questions. All of us, we need to ask it. And why we need to ask it? Because if you are going to answer these questions, we will be able to achieve the full uh, you know, vision about smart cities in Oman. So let me speak more about our goals, uh, you know, in smart cities. One of the most important thing is not just, you know, in our projects, everywhere though, around the world. If you are going to speak about smart cities, we have first to speak about the governance. Because when it comes to the governance, everyone will ask that question. Who's responsible about that? Who's going to lead that? Who's going to implement that? So we have to speak about policies. Which policy that we are going to to use, for example. So we can create policies if we don't have policies. Why? Because we need to have these policies to be you know, used by the governance, by the cities, by the government sector, private sector, and the other sectors that we have mentioned in the previous slides. Regulations to be followed up, frameworks. Sometimes we need models, for example, if I'm going to focus on a city that I want it to be a touristic city or logistic city, what are the best models for them so they can follow it up? And the laws, sometimes we need laws because if you are thinking about it as a national project, sometimes you need yeah, to have a power. So you have to make a law about it. For example, when it comes to the government sector, you need different sectors to work at the same time. 
don't let one organization, for example, to dig, for example, today for the electricity, you know, uh, channels and so on. And the next day, another one is coming and digging your area and so on. So we have to be very careful about that with the regulation. And we have to do that with all our stakeholders that we have mentioned, the five main se sectors, the government, the private, the academia, the SMEs and all the community, because you cannot speak about the governance if you are not engaging with everyone. So when it comes to the, uh, the second goal of smart city, we need to have our own index. We need to have our own assessment. How we are going to assess each city in Oman? Are they doing well or not? Okay, why we need really to do that assessment? We need to create more you know, awareness and we need to empower them so they can, you know, we have some competences between the different organizations, or let us say, between the different cities in Oman. Because we need, for example, one of the cities to be, for example, the most uh, you know, touristic city in Oman, the most advanced city in technology and so on. So when we have our own indicators, and when I say our own indicators, we are not going to follow, for example, just the international indicators. We have to create the indicators that are going to be you know, fitting to the environment of Oman. So that is very important. And one of the uh, dimensions that we are really going to uh, you know, focus on it, how we are going to have a smart ecosystem, the smart city that everyone is dreaming to live in that one. Smart people, what are real people looking for? Are we really engaging them in planning for the smart city projects? Smart living, what are the services that we as a citizens, the people, what are they really lo looking? Smart health, smart education, and so on. There are other sectors that they are really looking for. So we're gonna, you know, uh, have some assessment on these areas that we need to make sure is really followed by all of these cities in Oman. The third goal is going to be on the global collaboration because, you know, as you listened to my previous uh, uh, colleagues about, you know, the different technology and so on. Sometimes we need this collaboration with the different organization. So we can get you know, some lessons learned from them. We can exchange the experience with them. So we can start implementing some of these practices in Oman. And uh, also we are going to work in empowering cities. When it comes to empowering cities, how we are going to empower cities? Because when it comes, we are going to have like, as I said, like we are, we are having the new system of the governance. Each governor has to lead his governance or let us say the cities under his governance. So we have to have a sustainable development in building capacity, providing, for example, innovation research center, uh, consultancy in some of the projects, some engagement with different stakeholders that they needed to, in their city. And we have also to let the people in that city to work closely with the project owners in that city so they can have the perfect projects in their city. And when it comes to the fifth goal, it's about smart Oman. One of the things that we are trying to do, and we have already started launching it, and I'm going to speak more about it in the next slide. We have launched uh, last month about smart Oman. And the reason of this, it's like a smart hub for all the smart solutions in Oman. Why we need it? Because, you know, sometimes when you are speaking about smart solutions, government, you know, or let us say, you know, the different cities will say, we hear about these solutions. But sometimes they say it is, you know, impossible to implement it. But when they know we have some real solutions, we have some real examples from different organizations that really encourage, you know, these organizations to adopt these new solutions. And we have already done launch like uh, different smart solutions from different organizations. And that uh, one of them was in blockchain and one about artificial intelligence, the use of drones and so on. So, you know, uh, we are trying to market for this solution. So the other organization, they can hear about it and they start the implementation. We don't want them just to hear about this solution. They say, no, it's impossible. We cannot do it. We need them to start working so they can improve their service, improve, you know, uh, the infrastructure in their cities. And the one of, uh, yes, and pilot projects. Uh, we need to do more pilot projects in smart uh, cities in Oman. And we have already started on that. Uh, Docom Smart City is one of the pilot projects that we are trying to work closely with them because it's like a best environment so we can have the different implementation on it. Uh, we have also smart solutions in AI drones because uh, I'm now currently a member of uh, AI Center and Advanced Technologies in MTC IT. We are trying to collaborate with the different, uh, you know, SMEs, the private sector, so we can, you know, have different POCs in these smart technologies. 
And uh, one of the coming, uh, you know, uh, projects that we would like, you know, uh, to share some information about it is Smart Fuel Station. We are going uh, to announce soon about it because when it comes, you know, as I said, it's not just about technology. It's about, you know, how you plan it very well and what are the best cities to have first to these, you know, pilot projects. So these are some pilot projects and more pilot projects are coming because we're gonna choose some cities or some governments to start some of these, you know, implementing these uh, projects on it. Then we will move to the other cities or governments around Oman. And lastly, the funding model. One of the most challenging questions that we are always asked that, you know, the funding of smart cities projects are really expensive. So people are asking this question, what is the best funding model? So we are going, to, inshallah, during this project to explore different models of funding. We are going, you know, to have uh, global best practices, listen, learn. So we can see what is the best model for each city or for each government or for each organization. So we can implement some of the smart solutions or let's just say the model of a smart city in Oman. So this is brief about our main goals in smart city in Oman. So as I said, you know, uh, I'm going to speak more about Smart Oman, you know, which is one of the initiatives that we have launched recently. And as I said, it's the central hub that we are trying to collect all these smart solu solutions uh, under one hub. So uh, the initiative world, as I said, building a central hub for all smart initiatives in Oman, and all of it is going to be in the Omanuna portal, which is the first government portal in Oman. And building a strong bridge between the stakeholders. As I said, we need to have a bridge between you know, the government sector with the private sector or with the academia or the SMEs and the you know, community. Market and defining smart initiatives of Oman locally and globally, because some of the smart solutions, and I'm happy and proud to say that we have some private uh, companies who started going, you know, marketing for their solutions globally. So they started having, you know, global customers uh, to get their services uh, from Oman. And building a platform that serves researchers and academia, because we got a lot of questions. Every time, you know, the academia, they are asking the same questions. How can I know what are the, what are the data or what are the smart solutions has been implemented previ previously and so on. So we need to have a platform that has all the required data that's going to support all the academia, inshallah, and market smart solutions to companies so they can, you know, uh, the SMEs, they are the ones who are going to implement this so they can, you know, uh, the private sector can deal with them or the government sector as their, you know, customers. So this is brief about uh, Smart Omanuna. And as I said, we are going to uh, work with all of our sectors, which are the private sector, government, individuals, SMEs, and academia. And that's all about the smart initiatives. We have already launched uh, four initiatives. I don't have it here, but if you need to know more about our smart initiatives that we have launched recently, you can log in to our social media accounts so you can know more about the smart solutions that we have launched recently. Some of them in blockchain, some on AI, drones, uh, 3D printing, and recently we have launched about smart energy. And that's all about our smart energy. And we are still, you know, inviting other people in Oman or other companies who haven't registered yet their smart solution to be part of this initiative. And that's all about Smart City Project. And thank you so much. So, and if you need more detail to know about this project, you can reach us anytime through the, you know, contact details in this slide, or you can reach me also in LinkedIn as I'm very active there and happy to answer your questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Laila, for this very nice presentation on, uh, which provide us with a holistic overview on the strategy of Oman. Uh, smart city. Uh, I completely agree it shouldn't be uh, one entity responsible for uh, implementation of, it should be adopted uh, on different so uh, level of society and by yeah. different entities, SME, people, uh, government, and so on. Um, all right, let's move on to the next uh, presentation. So uh, we now have uh, Mohamed Ali Hamani uh, from France from Bordeaux. Uh, he is a uh, AI and IoT program manager of PNI Technologies Europe. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me uh, during this uh, amazing event. 
so basically my presentation will be more business focused because we are a business company and we are uh, tackling um, EI and especially AGI project all over EMEA region. Uh, so I'll begin by sharing my screen. Uh, here we go. Here. Here. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. So uh, welcome to my presentation. So basically, uh, I'll be talking about uh, this uh, trend, which is edge EI. So everything regarding artificial intelligence, not in the data center. Uh, so basically, uh, um, use cases about inference and a couple of products that we are um, uh, putting on the market. Um, and I'll be I'll, I'll finish uh, something with uh, with a focus on startups, um, and I will explain you how we are also tackling this ecosystem in 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 Europe and uh, especially in Middle East and more and more in Middle East. So, um, do you do you still hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So basically, uh, just to begin with, presenting a little bit myself. So I'm uh, currently program manager at, at PNY Technology Europe. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a company uh, partner with NVIDIA since uh, almost 20 years now, uh, basically in GPUs, historically in GPUs, but uh, the couple of, I mean, maybe five to 10 years ago, we, 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 uh, we chose to go more and more on AI. So we, we began on, on, on uh, uh, data centers and everything regarding the servers. And we are moving uh, since uh, two or three years uh, to, the, to the market of the AGI. Um, so I'm also, I have a, a good expertise in, in immersive technologies. So I, I, I was uh, a couple of um, uh, time ago in, in, um, in Qatar where I was heading virtual, the virtual reality section at Qatar University. I'm also involved in, in, in the, all the ecosystem about immersive technologies with the association and with the uh, initiative uh, in Middle East and in, in Europe. So we can also have the opportunity in the future to talk about this technology, amazing one. Uh, so quick agenda. So we will begin with uh, with the short introduction of PNY. I will talk a bit uh, about AI, but uh, you are guys, you guys, you are more expected than me. So I will be quick on that. Uh, I will present uh, all the use cases or a couple of use cases that we are tackling right now and the product to market that we are offering uh, right now um, in, in based on NVIDIA uh, solutions. So basically, PNY Technology is a company located in France, in Bordeaux, uh, and we are a sister company of, uh, uh, of PNY uh, US, so we are covering all over all the world, it's, uh, and we have also subsidiaries in, in Asia and, uh, in, um, and also an office in Dubai where, where we are covering uh, some projects in the region. Uh, so here our presence all over the world. And we are tackling those kind of projects actually. Uh, some of them are quite exciting. So we are working with uh, NVIDIA to offer to the market and to our uh, to, 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 uh, to research center, to universities, everything regarding autonomous car. So based on uh, um, NVIDIA drive uh, solutions. So AGX, NX and so on. We are uh, collaborating with, uh, with, with some scientists and science center on astrophysics, uh, medical imaging. We are also tackling in France, nuclear, uh, everything regarding energy uh, and uh, also more and more everything regarding fraud detection. So you, you know that uh, the data from finance is quite huge and we are having uh, hardware and software solution to, uh, to implement this kind of monitoring, monitoring sorry, and detection. So this is our offering. Actually, we are trying to uh, to cover all the, the 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 wide range of AI. So uh, so so basing on GPUs. So we have this part, this classical part, which is the graphics. But we are offering HPC solutions based on, on Tesla, for example, Nvidia Tesla, and 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 uh, se several kind of uh, um, GPU server. And we have this this edge AI uh, uh, part uh, based on uh, GPUs specifically built for this. Uh, I'm quite uh, I'm quite sure for a lot of you are uh, similar with the Jetson. 
So here, here are the coverage. So we, we are covering data center. We, so we are implementing right now in Middle East, for example, a lot of uh, huge data center for EI in UE in Saudi Arabia and so on. And we are pushing more and more to the edge uh, using devices that will allow us to have uh, car detection, face detection, and a lot of other cases, and I will mention a couple of them later on. So here I, I just uh, put for information for you to see the, the trend uh, on 40 years of CPU trend data. So we are seeing a, 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 an expansion on this, this field and PNY and another, uh, a lot of other company uh, with NVIDIA are, are offering solution to, to resolve this, this kind of um, issues. Uh, so here the inference side. So basically, what is the inference? The inference is uh, the ability of machine to um, to uh, to act by their own on the field. Uh, so they can detect uh, based on, on a trained model that we train in the, the data center, and this model will be implemented in in this device. For example, using uh, Jetson device. Um, and uh, with no link with the data center. So it will be by its own uh, detecting and uh, 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 with the output, which is scoring. So the scoring can be face detection or plate detection or, uh, or any, any kind of, uh, of, the, of use case that or, or, or application that you, we want to, to have. So this is uh, what we are and personally what I'm focusing uh, since one year is this edge ER or inference or uh, the field EI uh, solutions. So, yeah, so basically, um, I just skipped another, another slide to, to go to the smart cities uh, focus. So, we are facing an expansion, a huge expansion on cities on, on, on our planet. So you will see in, in this slide that uh, that in the couple of uh, the next 100 years, we'll have a huge amount of cities, more than 100 uh, million people. So a lot of um, citizen on residential issue will be um, harder and harder to solve with the, with the classical or typical way to manage cities right now. So one of them is transportation. So we will have a huge tension on tra transportation from the, the public transportation to the pu uh, pu public uh, pool to the private one. So how to manage car traffic, how to optimize railway, subway, and so on and so forth. Another part of the well-being of a citizen or resident in a big city is everything related to the services. So um, collecting waste, managing the water, uh, detecting if it's too, too high, so we have to implement some actions in the public policies. So all this will be more and more uh, a huge issue in in the the the, the big and the, the the big cities that will 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 appear and the big that we are existing and they will getting bigger uh, even more in the future. So here, how how HEI or how EEI on the field uh, can can do optimization. So. Uh, Without going in, in a lot of academia from my side, I, I will I will give you examples. So, for example, to optimize the energy, we can implement smart lightning. So, like smart lightning will detect the pedestrian, the the crowd, uh, and uh, and turn on the the, the 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 public lightning. If there is no one in the area, it will be shut down. So, will uh, in a, in in a scale of a big city, it will be a good. Uh, I mean, uh, um, an important impact in the. In the overall energies. So we will have uh, smart devices implemented in in waste uh, uh, in waste I mean in waste uh, infrastructure in the city. Uh, so no no need to 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 implement a schedule to uh, um, to collect the waste uh, in a non flexible way. So uh, we will allow the, the the public services to be notified if it's there is a need of of uh, of collecting and it will be applicable for a lot of other things things like water management, uh, like lightning and so on and so forth. A lot of things that are implementing uh, implemented right now and uh, there is a huge project in, in the Middle East and we are, one, we are glad to be one of, uh, uh, of, of, of the main provider on this is uh, traffic management and traffic safety uh, um, 
in in the field. So basically, the idea is to implement smart devices in all the roundabouts um, uh, to uh, to uh, allow the public services, the police, to detect. Uh, traffic violation to to detect uh, a crowdy uh, area on, on the road in order to adapt the, the signal so this is uh, uh, something that is already implemented and a lot of uh, solution are around this and with with a link to another um, annex so a next um, feature which is uh, parking management. So, uh, of course, with Edge AI, we can we can detect uh, and optimize the the parking distribution in in, in big parking. So, uh, other other uh, uh, use cases that we are uh, covering, especially in Europe. Uh, so, everything regarding, for example, smart retail. We are seeing more and more uh, in Europe, in UK, in France, and so on, what we call cashless retails or cashless shops. So, the idea is to go inside the shop, no need to to take out your your card. You pick your items. So, the camera uh, powered by Jetson solution will detect your items. Will of course detect you as a customer, and you will be able to just go out without uh, uh, stopping by your checkout, for example. So this is uh, a big trend on retail and we are seeing uh, uh, guys like Amazon uh, doing pilot in the US and uh, a lot of other company in UK and uh, more and more in France are doing this. There is also regarding um, uh, speeding up the, the, the checkout in the restaurant and now I have a slide on this and we can discuss it. Uh, so we have also access uh, control, everything regarding hazard in, in trail, uh, in, um, and railway infrastructure, everything also regarding airport, so detection of uh, hazard and everything. Uh, a big trend on AGI um, on, on the field, it's uh, of course autonomous driving cars, so uh, the main car manufacturers are investing a lot of money on this. We are seeing a brilliant example like Tesla in, in the US uh, doing an amazing job on that. Uh, a lot of universities uh, in Europe are investing a lot of money for research uh, to, to, to implement uh, autonomous bus, autonomous uh, inside premises, for example, in some campuses, waiting for the legislation and the policies to change, especially in Europe. But the time will come uh, when the policy and when the product will be mature for this market. And we are seeing a lot of university putting a lot of research on that uh, in order to be ready uh, with, with joint collaboration with the business. And of course, other, other solution and use cases that we are, uh, med uh, uh, are tackling, like medical imaging, defense, and smart wa uh, warehousing. I took this first example. So basically, uh, uh, um, Post-COVID, we will uh, we are seeing the restaurant crowded again, and a lot of uh, uh, new restaurants are e equipping their uh, checkout corner with uh, smart cameras in order to detect the the choices of the customer and allow them to go directly to uh, to, to the payment, uh, optimizing the the queues and the waiting uh, in front of the shops. So uh, that will impact the the the, the overall. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, value, so we'll have more customer attending because there is there will be uh, less queues. Uh, a lot of uh, rail station and subway are equipping right now in Europe uh, with, with smart detection. So it will allow us uh, to, to, to have access to a certain area in, in warehouses, but also to, to, to access directly to the, to the top level transportation with face recognition. Those systems are enough accurate not to be triggered by uh, any kind of heart or uh, eyeglasses that you, you might have. I will finish by... Uh, uh, something that is less known in the market as uh, um, as it's 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 um, I, I like to say that it's smart boxes, but basically it's it's uh, um, it's it's devices that will embed Jetson power powerful uh, GPUs, so it can be from low power to high up power, so from nano to uh, to AGX, and they will tackle uh, essentially video analytics or video detection. Uh, so we those devices can be uh, implemented in, in, in retail shops, in, in manufacturing, in real estate station. Uh, they, are, they have a low footprint and they, 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 ha they are very optimized to, uh, to low consumption and they might be organized for speci specific implementation in buses, for example, or in a dusty area and so on and so forth. And we have also some kind of camera that 
implement already the JSON inside it, so you don't have to have two two devices. So you will have you will have the ability to implement smart cameras uh, with the GPUs power uh, directly in the field. Uh, something very important, uh, and we are seeing a lot of uh, of asking on on the market. So now we are implementing more and more thousands of unit of of uh, AGI solution. Uh, so so. Uh, it, it adds complexity on the implementation, on the monitoring, and on, on the upgrade, on the patching of the, the devices. So now um, a lot of companies are working, or startups even in, in Middle East are working on this kind of feature, it's fleet management. So we are offering also solution to organize, to, uh, to set up and to monitor all the fleet management. Uh, it can be more than 20,000 uh, for smart cities. And uh, I, I need to say also that uh, in smart cities, this uh, fleet management is a critical point. Here, a, a small example, but I can share the, the slides later on with the, the person interested to know a little bit more of, about fleet management. Um, of course, fleet management, uh, I mean, everything uh, regarding AGI can be managed on, uh, with, with, uh, 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 with the data center uh, in premises, but also with uh, compatibility with all the, the, um, the cloud uh, providers. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are uh, working a lot of startups and uh, I'm, I'm personally uh, a coach for startups in, in a couple of incubator. And with NVIDIA, we are pushing and we are helping from our side to raise visibility of NVIDIA inception program for, for startups. So basically it's a, like an ecosystem uh, a, or like a, a virtual incubator for startup working based on GPUs. So it will allow them to have the support of uh, PNY and NVIDIA uh, by hardware, uh, by uh, go, uh, going to look for fund, fundraising. Uh, and the idea is here to have champions of uh, GPUs um, uh, use cases, uh, so EI and HEI, and the idea also is to, to have the, them scale up, uh, and uh, uh, I need also to know, uh, to, to tell you that uh, uh, the, start, the startup that go out from inception program are going in another ecosystem in NVIDIA called Metropolis ecosystem, and this ecosystem is uh, sh shine all over the world, so we can, we can provide a big project for those startups uh, when they uh, are uh, on board on those kind of projects. So um, I guess it's all for me. Uh, just to mention that uh, in Middle East, we have a partner called Advisor Integration located in Dubai, uh, in Dubai, yes. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So it was a really important topic about the uh, edge analytics, right? Analytics on the edge and uh, covered a lot of use cases with the uh, hardware uh, on the edge, which provides the uh, insight straight away. Um, yeah, NVIDIA is hard to get nowadays, right? So there are a lot of competitors to get the uh, graphic cards, right? It's a gamer. Absolutely. It's a cryptocurrency miners and it's uh, AI experts. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good. Good. There is a, a, an announcement on on crypto card uh, made like a couple of weeks ago, so we can we can discuss it uh, after the call. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Dr. Samit uh, Chaudhary. He's a founder and chairman of Gaia Smart Cities from Mumbai, India. India. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to get sharing rights uh, so that I can share my uh, screen. There you are. Hi, my, uh, my name is Sumit Chaudhary, and I started a company about six years ago when India started its uh, Smart Cities program, and we called it Gaia Smart Cities. And our whole focus was to build solutions that will help the city gather a lot of data. So we are really measurement guys who are instrumenting a city. Uh, we also started, like David mentioned, um, uh, working on LoRa-based solutions, but eventually we started building uh, GSM-based solutions and then moved more on building both edge and cloud-based uh, technologies for helping cities. And we have helped a variety of cities. So I also want to give my version of what a smart city is. And you can take any city and a smart city is one that is, becomes a conscious city, is always measuring itself. 
it's aware of what is going on it is measuring its water it is measuring its people it's measuring its pollution it is measuring its uh, education funding everything it is always measuring itself and it corrects what it is measuring and you are smart when you can measure and correct yourself there is no destination called smart cities there is always going to be learning and there is going to be movement of ideas and of your parameters that you are going to do so we put all our effort in becoming really good at measurement of various aspects of a city and when you start measuring things you do better governance and i think uh, uh, ma'am mentioned uh, um faz ma'am also mentioned about the governance of the city so if we take a look at what we have done uh, we have been the cios of cities i personally have been cios of major telecom and infrastructure companies in the world Uh, both in the us uh, in asia pac uh, and in india and uh, we created a set of capabilities to do consulting strategy and design for smart cities implementation both oversight and to provide solutions and then finally do managed services operations so our skills as a company in gaia has been in in city program management we have worked with multiple cities and i'll talk about it in monitoring and performance evaluation of projects uh, detailed assessment reports project planning structuring budgeting uh, and tender and bid evaluations of other uh, providers and and master system integrators uh, of the city uh, we also have done blueprinting city blueprinting and design and invited uh, other companies to come and uh, respond to those and we have done this functional design of various services and use cases that were talked about by uh the earlier speakers i don't want to go into details but that's what we do for a living and also finally implementation management we have done command centers integrated command centers data platforms data centers um we have been system integrators and also provided our own solutions and one of the solutions that we focus in is the uh, the lora based uh, sensor network for a city and that we have done in a couple of places so that's our portfolio we have been uh, a startup but as a startup we have got extraordinary experience working in the smart city space uh, i also am a visiting faculty at carnegie mellon in the us where i teach a course on ai and smart and uh, implementation of these technologies in smart cities so if i take a look at our credentials uh, we have done um, iot platforms for sanitation uh, for cold chain warehouses for experience management uh, for water pilots in in railways in indian railways which is the largest railway network a lot of automation is happening around there uh, we have also worked in hospitals and healthcare and finally citizen services and we have put our own iot and saas based um, edge platforms to ensure that we are able to provide that measurement and governance that is required for smart cities once again smart cities is not a destination we are constantly evolving our solutions and we are finding that uh, every few months and every few years we have got newer uh, use cases to work on Uh, from a consulting and advisory services uh, we have done the smart city plans for uh, 14 out of the indian smart 100 smart cities projects we have done program management for three of them we have done technology blueprints uh, we have done real estate projects and also worked in national and state level um, uh, advisory positions across the country so that sort of summarizes the scope of what we have done and therefore seen a lot of use cases being developed and implemented and a lot of challenges that you face when you implement the technologies that a lot of our previous speakers talked about it is not about the technology in fact most of the time we have found that it is in the implementation and change management and roll out that these technologies fail these technologies don't scale up and not provide the business benefits that was envisioned and without these business benefits none of what we are talking about is going to really come in handy will come to fruition we are not going to see adoption of these technologies over time they are good toys to play with i have worked in this for 6 years i have seen a lot of technologies come in but very few of them really scale and so this this uh, comex is about ai and surveillance and i think surveillance is the one where most of these technologies have come in really handy one because security is a very important aspect and two because there are commercial use cases of surveillance where we have got better road management uh, and automated ticketing of uh, traffic violations which has provided the funds required to create sustainable solutions unless we create sustainable solutions we are not going to see adoption in in 
my experience in the Indian 100 smart cities, there are only the surveillance projects which have given an ROI and the rest of them have been deployed and implemented, but uh, I don't see a sustainable uh, continuance of those technologies over time because even in sanitation, even if you take a look at um, various um, uh, projects that are going on, uh, we don't see this the, the concept of sustainability and and bringing in the revenue that is going to come to generate more implementations. Some of the technologies that people talked about are being pushed by private sector, like in retail, uh, like in um, uh, some of the fleet management and logistics. Uh, but if you take a look at the larger smart city urban infra ecosystem, it needs to be adopted by the city pro and the urban local bodies across the country to, to make it uh, sustainable and viable. So when we go in, we try to create a partnership approach. And I think this was talked about in the Oman smart city concept that was just spoken about that you need to create these uh, partnerships between the city, uh, between the city and urban local bodies, uh, the urban local bodies and infrastructure players, infrastructure players and retail and, and tech companies that provide the stack and create sustainable models for them, create PPP models where they all win at the end of the day. And how do you develop these models? How do you develop the funding ecosystems for it? And how do you create win-win situations for everybody, right? So we have worked with townships and campuses, which are actually private uh, city operators and looking at their blueprints, there is a sustainable model because people are paying for those additional services in the larger city system. A lot of technology that is being deployed is not being paid for by retail consumers or by the citizens of the city. They want good services, but unless they see the value, they are not able to put a dollar for provide for consuming those services. Once again, we have seen good adoption of the same technologies that cities are using, but in retail uh, for buildings, for commercial real estate. They are also looking at surveillance. They are also looking for security. They are looking for SCADA based uh, automation of water supply, power monitoring. Uh, but as soon as you try to scale these, especially in India, where there are almost a billion people, the funding is just not available to make it impactful for each person. And when that doesn't happen, you're not able to justify. And that's what um, our ex uh, experience has been in the, in the country. When we take a look at our um, intellectual property that we have developed over the last six years, we have our own IoT hardware platform. We are able to integrate water meters, power meters, uh, gas sensors, um, uh, environmental sensors, uh, pressure, uh, fire equipment monitoring. All of these things need to be integrated and brought into an edge intelligence platform. And we have created our own um, STM32 based um, edge, uh, smart edge device, which is able to filter out a lot of the noise in the ecosystem and send out only the alerts back to the network server and back to the IOT platform that we have got at the, at the cloud level. And then we build a citywide master system integrator platform. And we are working with a European uh, consortium partner called five air. And we build the MSI platform for bringing in all the alerts from the different uh, sensors and different devices and create end to end stitched use cases that have a business value. We work with the cities to create what this mission is going to be, what these use cases are going to be. How do you make them sustainable? How do you create the analytics and visualization? And finally, one of the systems that we have found a lot of takers is the people management. There's a lot of distributed employees and assets of a city that need to be engineered, that need to be alerted when there is a problem. So we have developed our own people management solution, a workforce management solution for cities, which allows these local groups of people who have got the skills and resources to be alerted. And most of what we work on today is not about the cities. It is actually about a lot of smart projects. The projects are in agriculture, so water supply, solid waste, power, transport, safety. All of these are essentially collected connecting billions of devices and billions of people. So we have built a platform which allows us to integrate both the devices as well as the people and make them talk to each other. 
So a meter can send out an alert to a very specific person to come and respond to it. Either it is the resident of the house or it is the trouble. If the meter is generating faults, then it will bring in the repair mechanic to do it. The same meter sending a same alert can alert different people to do different use cases. Similarly, we can do it for leak detection. We can do it for uh, metering. We can do it for, um, for environmental monitoring, sending out alerts, uh, power monitoring. We have, we have found interesting use cases where, uh, when there is disconnection of power supply in the last mile, we are able to alert the power supply distributor to go and do something about it. And, and similar small projects we have realized can actually have a very high impact. If you take a look at the projects that we talk about, they are high investment projects and low investment projects. We do not need high investment projects all the time to be high on innovation and to have high impact. So we need to look at these low investment, high innovation, high impact projects where we are able to reach a lot of people and make impact in a lot of lives and creating a sustainable ecosystem for uh, for us in the in the smart city space and whenever i talk about measurement there is an element of learning and there is an element of automating this learning through ai and if you don't go all the way and do only leave it at measurement if you have a benefit of x if you put machine learning you have benefit of 5x and if you put ai on top of it an automation which is going to be driven by the data that you're collecting you are going to have a a hundred X impact if you are able to bring all of it together. And we have seen this journey. And I think uh, the gentleman from Huawei talked about this journey of, of uh, how mature you are in the process. And the more analytics that you do, the more automation that you do, and the more alerting of the real person that you can do to have an impact, that is where we are going to start seeing sustainable development. Um, we, we talked about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time that we have to create an impact both uh, in the basic life. And in India, we, we see a lot of projects being done just to ensure we have good water, good power, good energy. Um, but you also have to improve the quality of life. You also have to bring in maximum life. And some of the use cases that were talked about probably focuses on maximum life. Maximum life where you are being extremely efficient, but that is going to be for a 1% of the population of the country. Basic majority of the, uh, the infrastructure that we are talking about today where AI is going to have a high impact is in the ease of life and the quality of life uh, buckets. It will probably not have too much impact on the basic, but that is where we are seeing. We have implemented AI for voice detection, for uh, signal processing, for, for allocation of work to people, just like Uber and, uh, and uh, Lyft can do. They are essentially allocating work micro tasks to different drivers based on different algorithms and we have developed similar algorithms to manage staff of the city we need to micromanage each an element each and every aspect of the city's assets both people machines and processes and stitch it together for for creating an ease of life and a quality of life and i'll not go into these parameters that everybody is trying to monitor and a lot of these um, smart city plans have got to do with governance where uh, we see a lot of impact of technology and AI coming in, in health, in sanitation, in water waste reuse, uh, energy conservation, transport and mobility. I think everybody talked about it, so I'm not going to repeat it. And we see the impact of putting high tech and AI into these aspects of uh, smart cities plan, but in specific use cases, we can envision as technology people, this grand central command center doing everything that is never going to happen. Uh, you are going to see small uses of AI embedded in every aspect of the city's operation and they need not all come together and it is okay to be distributed. It is okay to be in pockets in wherever we see impact, not try to bring it all together. I think we have seen a lot of plans of bringing everything together, but they have all failed of bringing everybody together, bringing all systems together, bringing it all into a command center, not required. Let it be distributed. And that is how networks of intelligence is going to be built in a smart city. A smart city is not about one command center where everything is bringing. It's like a human body where every aspect of your human body is extremely smart. 
each piece of it can be made smart using technology in the edge as was talked about instead of bringing everybody together into a central command center through 5g networks and i, I think we have seen i'm a telecom cio i have seen a lot of plans around bringing everything together none of them have worked a telecom company barely manages to keep its own network together in a smart city plan and i've been part of the largest telecom companies in the world and i we will have to create distributed smartness in a city distributed intelligence and let each piece independently become smarter and collectively become even smarter so i'm going to stop here there's a lot of other slides around financing and making sure that they are sustainable we have worked in our um, uh, biggest work has been over the last uh, six, five years has been in the city of agra many of you know it it's one of the most well known cities in the country and uh, we have worked with this city to create a lot of plans to improve the social equity tourism sustainable livelihoods uh, enabling of green spaces and uh, we have created uh, citizens applications adaptive traffic control uh, data centers intelligence command centers all of these things are all coming together now they all do not need to come together in the command center though we do have a command center but the intelligence is distributed and that's what i want to leave you with uh, today uh, this is how the command center looks it is more uh, gimmicky in terms of creating these large screens but those little computers are all doing their own little thing in managing water managing traffic managing uh, these cities became the covid command center for the city and the the implementation of uh, these smart city technologies for ensuring better dissemination of information better command, better control of healthcare facilities better control of uh, public gathering through these command centers has actually come in really handy for uh, for the smart cities so i'm going to uh, roll through the sides and and stop here if there are any questions around uh, what we have done and uh, how we can help you uh, you know how to reach out thank you Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. So it's really impressive portfolio of the use cases and the uh, expertise you shared with us. Uh, and I yeah, completely agree that one thing is a technological mature, another thing is changing the business processes, right? So uh, where the hustle is, right? And so, Amar, should we move towards the question answering session? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for all these great presentations. Um, so now is the time for the question and answers. So um, any delegates, feel free to send through your questions either to the chat or the Q&A. So I think we can start with the chat. <clears throat> I think there was a few comments here uh, for the digital twins. Um, Hussein Lawati asking for if he can be contacted on that email address, and for the city I. Uh, so if if uh, if he can be contacted um, in relation to that, please. Uh, then question for Miss Layla. Uh, is is Layla still with us? I'm not sure if she's still. No, Amar. Uh, she sent a message that she had to leave, so we can take the question and then we can pass it on to her. As she okay. said, she can be contacted on LinkedIn, so maybe that's an easy way. Okay, so we can copy this in, uh, question to her from that delegate. Uh, there was a question from our speaker, John, John Griffiths himself, uh, um, himself uh, but again, um, uh, Leila is not currently here. So we can put both of you in touch. Um, let me make pandemic proof. I think that was a question on uh, making the cities pandemic proof. Yes, uh, yes, that's about a, how that's an interesting. Um, um, yes, yeah, so that, that mm. yeah. I, I, do you want to uh, speak a little bit about that, uh, Sumit? Yeah, I, I can. I can take that uh, for the last um, one one and a half years. We have been working quite actively uh, in the um, in the smart cities as well as in in the COVID response across the country, and. Um, uh, can a city become pandemic proof uh, probably not given the in the in the context of how we saw this uh, particular um, uh, pandemic but can we be better prepared for it can we have better information can we have uh, better planning and uh, can we use data for this planning uh, to do it and at the end of the day we as technologists can can provide 
solutions to the cities so that they can better prepare themselves just in case something happens and it's one type of pandemic that happened and we learned how to deal with it tomorrow it could be a completely different type and we have to learn again but do we have the right resources can we create a a uh, can the city respond to it faster it has taken us a long time to create structures uh, command centers uh, vaccines all of these things took us time this time around can we be better prepared i think uh, a city can can definitely uh, create structures can create uh, response mechanisms can create um, uh, volunteers in the city nobody can really um, prepare for 100 times increase in in requirement of anything because you cannot spend that kind of money but can you create structures around your city can you create can you get your citizens to support can you create your uh, uh, defense mechanisms to come in uh, to help you uh, respond to such calamities in the in the city i think that we can help out um, surveillance has helped out in a very big way uh, getting volunteers together has helped out getting information out to citizens using the te same technologies that were there in the in smart cities projects has helped out quite a bit so yes cities can become uh, ready for tackling wetter but it cannot probably become future proof pandemic proof um is my take i will leave it to other um, speakers to uh, to come up with better ways in which to make it proof mm. sure if any other speaker would like to answer that and i think um sumit mentioned something which was very good which is that obviously, obviously uh, many future pandemics will come our way and i think it's not just related to pandemic to some any emergency situation how can we use uh um the tracking and surveillance to be able to uh perhaps stop people from going to certain areas or to guide them on kind of which areas to um to move through the city so i don't know if a, any other speaker wants to speak a little bit about uh, how we can make future cities pandemic proof i think i would like to add just a little bit to it that i think i agree with sumit that uh, at the end of the day uh anything anything that comes on your way and that needs resource increment of 100 200 300% overnight uh cannot be and i think cannot be it's not possible to be ready for that but uh you can make your systems in a way that uh you are able to better respond and the best way to do that is that if you have a city and in the inside the city you have your health system you have your uh emergency command system and you have your law enforcement you have your regulatory enforcement uh if everything is uh, from the regulation perspective politically uh, technologically uh, that has and digitally everything has transformed in the right way uh, so that they can function within themselves in the most optimized way and they can function together uh, when needed and collaborate with each other uh, in the most optimized way i think then we can reduce the impact uh and this is what we have seen here in uh, dubai as well in uae overall that all the different functions of uh, the country and abu dhabi and dubai and different parts of the country or uh, cities uh they were all functioning in their own space in their own place in the right way and uh, they were all functioning together in the right way so they were able to reduce the impact of uh, whatever what can could have been a bigger disaster this being a Uh, yes the population was low but it was a very, it is a very big transit point and when this thing happened at uh, i think at any given time if a city is being uh, visited by 10 to 15 million people uh, from outside and they have to come in and exit then who half of the economy of the city relies on that it's not an easy job so that is that is a classical example so i think many cities who were able to fight with it uh, or were are fighting with it are uh, i think this is one of the reason they are able to do that irrespective of the size <clears throat> Thank you for that Faisal. Um we have some more questions here. Just give me a second, it's not opening up for me. Uh, yes, um from Hanan Alani, uh, thank you for all the informative presentations with the development of smart cities and increased dependency on AI. how can nations ensure any cyber attacks do not disable complete towns and cities and what is the likelihood that this can happen uh, 
open uh, open up to to the panel. Yeah, maybe I would take this one. So, uh, in yeah. terms of cybersecurity attacks, uh, the majority of uh, cybersecurity more than fifty percent. Uh, uh, sorry, Ivan, your 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 voice is a little bit low. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Uh, in terms of cyber security attacks, the majority of attacks comes from social engineering, meaning that uh, it's actually the clicking on the links which you shouldn't click uh, by governmental bodies, uh, then um, uh, sharing accidentally a password and so on and so forth. So it's a social engineering. engineering. And in this case, uh, better training, better policies uh, should uh, uh, should decrease the amount of attacks. This is from one perspective. From another perspective, I really like what Mr. Chowdhury mentioned about the dist distributed uh, intelligence, right? So there is no one common center. There is a distributed intelligence and the uh, intelligence and the decision-making is done by uh, different parts of the body and the, uh, of uh, authorities. And this would decrease the effect of this uh, cyber attacks. So, but in general, yeah. So the duplication of the control systems or uh, increasing the uh, policy uh, working with the uh, personnel who is on the, uh, who is working with the software uh, is should be should be as a priority for um, for uh, governmental authority to avoid these cyber security attacks. Thank you for that, Ivan. And is there any other speaker who wants to add anything further before we move to the next question? <clears throat> In that case, uh, the, second, the next question is um, from Hanan Alani. Are any of your companies working on projects in poorer countries? Will the high capital investment required for smart city result in a larger gap in the standard of living between the developed and developing world? I think uh, there are uh, projects happening in a lot of African parts of uh, the continent and also in South uh, developing and underdeveloped countries. Uh, it's a different uh, way they are executing it because uh, it, it, first of all, when a city tries to become smarter, uh, not every city's main objective initially is to uh, handle their utilities or handle the smart traffic. Uh, a lot of cities, uh, most of the cities around the world, they all started from uh, first transition to a safe city because that also uh, is a pro massive, massive transformation itself because it brings in a lot of infrastructure in place and a lot of uh, transformation happening at uh, different uh, parts of the governance, law enforcement. And once this infrastructure is in place, the same infrastructure can be used uh, to take the city to a uh, smart city. And a lot of cities have done that. I think uh, in the developing world or underdeveloped countries, uh, what we have seen is more of the first step uh, becoming safer cities uh, and then doing smaller smaller pilot projects uh, to become uh, smart cities. And then from the financing perspective as well, uh, again, those cities have, some have taken uh, a route of government to government uh, uh, projects, some have taken public private, private partnership route and some have started smaller uh, smaller pilot projects in more, uh, uh, I would say that more important areas and then expanding them to uh, bigger areas. Some In some countries and some places, uh, operators played a very important role uh, in financing these kind of pilot projects. So there are different, there are a lot of models. So it's not being only adopted by rich uh, countries or the countries with high GDP and a lot of finan financial uh, muscle. So this is what actually at least I have seen as a trend across uh, where we have been working. <clears throat> Thank you again, Faisal, for, for answering that question. I'm a, um, <clears throat> yeah. I'd like to address that question, if I may. Sure. Um, one of the main things about uh, smart cities is financing. So as long as you can uh, finance a city, uh, it doesn't matter what background you're in you can do that. 
And um, I used to work for a company in as their uh, smart city design consultant for a company in Singapore. And one of the key drivers they had for making urbanization work is the concept of uh, land value capture. So land value capture is really quite straightforward. It's basically you take very uh, low value land and you build mass transit to that land. And then everything within 800 meters of the mass transit station tends to actually increase in value many fold because it becomes a pleasant place to live. So it's actually, um, a, a, you make it smart, sure. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of money to get your mass transit to that point. However, the value of the land that you decided to put the mass transit point on now has gone up in such sufficient value. You can, the, if the government bought it, for example, that you can afford to build another mass transit point and do it exactly the same again. So I think the issue with capital investment is, uh, in technology uh, is runs hand in hand with property and in successful smart city developments uh, they grow organically by the value of the land increasing due to the connectivity of the city and the uh, greater price of the jobs obviously there's a balancing act there um, if you're in uh, north africa you know it might be different to being in Vietnam, for, exa for example. However, the basic principles still work that because the capitalist idea of property prices increasing actually can fund not only 5G, 5G networks, um, it will also do all sorts of other uh, urban spaces. Um, but you can't really, you don't have to pull that money out as a country. You can actually generate that money by actually creating uh, effectively smart satellites to that city and then making that can then fund the city itself to become smart so i think just going out and asking for money to do a project is nowadays a bit naive going out and selling people they can get 10 percent on their investment in a property deal is much more realistic and you can then finance all of the infrastructure and as faisal said you know that the network you know, is is very important. You now need 5G, 4G, all those things at least to be said they're going there. But also you need decent transport. And the transport <clears throat> isn't the motor car. You know, it's, it's mass transit. And if you can do that, your uh, ability to uh, raise investment then actually is based on a physical, the property physical. And if that's the case, then all of a sudden you can get into a self-financing model to drag smart cities from uh, forward. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting way of looking at it. But I don't think AI or technology is the point. It actually is a property model, which then uh, people understand and feel comfortable with and can finance. Thanks for that, John. That's a very... Um interesting bit of information how kind of the um, smart city is also linked to the property as an investment uh, in the value of the um, property as well which is something I haven't thought of before so thank you for providing that uh, answer. Uh, we can go on to the next question um, from Mohammed. Uh, can we implement blockchain technology for smart cities like for national ID cards and other facilities? Maybe I, I would like to uh, address this one. Um, I wouldn't focus on, on the technology per se. I would focus on the value of the use case, right? So what's, uh, uh, it depends highly uh, uh, on different aspects, on security, on the uh, uh, maturity of the technology and so on and so forth. So far, uh, the blockchain, I don't think it's mature enough to move with this uh, sensitive information about the uh, uh, people's IDs, right? Uh, but in general, it's not about the technology or approach. It's more about the, uh, the value it would bring to people. So, and no one cares whether it's about blockchain behind the uh, electronic ID or just a simple uh, database uh, with, a, uh, with a very good security. Thank you for that, Ivan. Uh, 
Um, the, the next question was uh, for John Griffiths, where Mohammed has asked, can you use thermal camera to prevent falls, uh, false positives to avoid mishaps? Uh, yes, you can. Um, but you, uh, the main thing about thermal imaging is that uh, it obviously is, um, is uh, anonymous. You cannot tell who it is, which is a great advantage using thermal. And secondly, the, uh, there are some tricks that you've got to do with thermal, which many people do in, um, you know, we've all been looking at videos for years and years, but in thermal, very people aren't really used to dealing with thermal images and how you can refine them to actually pick up certain criteria, especially with the noise relating to it. Um, uh, the people have been asking whether we can use it on building sites and to, which is absolutely correct. Well, the interesting thing about building sites is that uh, most things uh, on a building site actually are steel or then they're not animated objects. And as such, it's actually quite easy to remove them from the image. So you can basically sit there and take out uh, functionality. And we've, we've used it only uh, at the moment to detect falls, but we believe there's going to be a lot of other applications in the home uh, where people start, um, I'm, I'm sure you know that some of the first things that identify a person as being unwell is gait, the way they walk, and issues relating to that. And we think there's a whole spectrum of things you can use the thermal uh, system for, uh, which can work to give you a, um, a very accurate result. Um, in, in our case, uh, we were given a threshold um, of 95% for the actual thermal image to detect a fall. Um, I'm pleased to say actually it's 100%. Um, and there are very few sensors that can work at 100%. Um, which, uh, so I'm sure it can be used uh, for many of those things. Um, it's just, we're just in the infancy of doing this. Um, one interesting bit, because I go back to the previous question about blockchain, is that um, the uh, really one of the main things about blockchain is it does have some really good uses. And um, I think uh, Summit mentioned Laura Networks. Well, there's a company called Helium, and Helium uh, uses, I've put them on the chat, um, they actually uh, persuade people to uh, buy their uh, gateways because one of the problems in smart cities is getting coverage and of wide, low power wide area networks for sensors. So what they did was they created their own cryptocurrency and they take a very small amount of that cryptocurrency for each 24 bytes that gets transferred over the system. And uh, they use blockchain for that. Now, the interesting thing is, um, if you look into helium currency, uh, the actual value of the currency is now, I think, $14. Um, so uh, what we're finding is that that's a really, investors are, book, are, are basically speculating on the currency, that the law and networks are gonna be so used in the future that the transmit will create currency from each gateway. So it, it actually persuades people uh, individuals to buy these gateways and connect them to their broadband, which solves one of the biggest problems in smart cities, which is connectivity of sensor devices, which is affordable. And uh, if you, um, as I said, I put helium in there, uh, it's really worth looking at because they 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 are absolutely exponentially taking off, and it's a real problem for the telcos because all of a sudden you've got a, 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 a well, I don't say an unregulated but a regulated environment of LoRa, which is very good at IoT, uh, being transferred. Normally, you'd have to put a network up and it would cost money, not huge money, but you used to have to cost money. But because of the blockchain background to Helium, that actually speculators are now actually funding the whole network, um, which is really quite an interesting model. Because once you've got a LoRa network and it's uh, relatively reliable, um, the smart city and 3D models and everything else can, are all affordable and you can start looking at carbon impact and uh, people counting and all those fun things that uh, people would like to do, but it's just too expensive over 
the network, which was GSM, which it was never designed to be run over anyway. So um, I think blockchain chain does have quite a significant um, application in uh, smart cities. And in healthcare, it's particularly useful for us because we, I, you know, this person hasn't been, uh, what the message didn't get through that this person had fallen. Our blockchain through Helium, we can say, yes, it did. And it was the call center that didn't reply to it. Um, so it's a very good quality control in that respect. I, I think blockchain is going to make a big difference to smart cities in the future uh, for reliability of sensor data. Thanks for that, John. Um, we can move to our next question. Uh, for, for Oman Smart City, how do you make sure you are investing in local data scientists? Also, what ways are you following to make sure that the people from the city who want to be part of uh, building the city can can contribute. This is from Ali al -Ghaithi. I can answer part of this, uh, then the other panelists can take on. Uh, for example, in Oman uh, or any other country where we are working, uh, as I also mentioned in my presentation, that, uh, that uh, it's not only you make the city smarter in terms of technology, but unless and until you do not invest in the human capital development, uh, it does not correspond uh, to the city becoming smarter and there are not enough people to make the operations of this whole environment sustainable. Uh, so what we do actually is uh, there are multiple steps that on the country level, uh, we have a very strong uh, programs like Seeds of the Future, and uh, with, uh, multiple programs where we work with uh, education sector, with government sector, we, and we uh, train uh, people from all these different sectors uh, on new technologies uh, like AI, like uh, cloud computing, like smart cities, uh, and things like that. And uh, that is one part of it. And we are running these programs in Oman as well, massively. Uh, and secondly, uh, we also, as I said, that when we develop these kind of projects, uh, we make sure that these projects have two uh, important elements always to it. One is uh, the training academies, uh, which continue to train the people uh, who are part of this project or who the people these, uh, for example, the Smart City Management Authority wants to train. Uh, those can be again government employees, students, uh, people of different walks of life and uh, on our side as well, the certifications are always available in this regard. Uh, the third part where we work very openly is our open labs. So what we do in our open labs is that uh, we, irrespective of what is the size of the company, uh, we uh, work with the local ecosystem, regional ecosystem, ISVs, uh, startups, and even individuals who want to be part of this open lab. And uh, we uh, take their contribution and we work with them to develop uh, different kind of use cases. For example, in a lot of smart city projects that happen in this region, uh, we incorporated a lot of startups, a lot of ISPs uh, on our open lab platform uh, to build their capabilities, enhance their capabilities further uh, to develop the complete ecosystem uh, which was used uh, in a smart city project because it's not one company that can build a smart city. It has to be a lot of partners coming in together. Even if uh, or, uh, there is one MSI of one smart city chunk or one smart district chunk all allocated by the government or any entity. So the, the, we work at multiple layers uh, to contribute uh, to complete uh, ecosystem uh, development ecosystem moving forward and enrichment of this ecosystem. So that is what uh, my take is on this. Thank you for that, Faisal. Uh, we can move on to our next question, which is uh, from Hiryan, uh, Hiryan Borade. So, so does waste management and e-waste, uh, so does waste management? I'll go to his next one where he says, can smart cities as a broad project uh, be agents of FDI and ultimately job creation for nationals? Um, I can, I'm happy to answer that. Um, yeah, well, I used to work in the Department of International Trade um, in the, for the UK government for three years 
on smart cities uh, in uh, well in Asia, um, China, Malaysia, Thailand, and and um, the answer is yes, it, it can. The, the natural trend for urbanisation <clears throat> is for more people to uh, actually go into the city for better paid jobs. And um, that causes its own problems. If we look, for example, in uh, Thailand, in Bangkok, where the city really is, um, is totally inundated with, uh, with people who commute in, and so the smart city, if you think about London, um, uh, in London, we have a very good transport network, <clears throat> very highly paid jobs. And the transport network um, is, I think, 73% of all travel into the city is done on the transfer on the network itself. Uh, when I was dealing with Bangkok, um, their actual amount of... Uh, people who actually use the public transport um, and also bus system, which I, I use public transport, was less than 5%. So you can see that there's there's going to be a huge issue with people just spending an awful lot of time traveling to and from work in a poor environment and then going from there. So actually making the city smart, and we see this in Kuala Lumpur too, with the finance districts, it enables you to look at areas that would otherwise be impossible because people who have high value uh, positions wouldn't travel there. It's too difficult. And uh, so with regards to the transport mechanisms, um, the ability to, as urbanization is regarded as being inevitable, um, the actual the infrastructure for um, the travel infrastructure is by far the best or in my opinion the best actual investment because it allows everything else to happen and to, to the job values to be increased because the quality of the companies that go there will be attracted to the city which is not only uh, obviously lower carbon footprint um, lower uh, air pollution but more importantly that the quality of life of the individuals that they wish to attract will be that much higher and therefore they'll work better. So I think, yes, it can, is a quick answer. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, Sadek, are there any further questions that you can see? No, Amar, uh, since we have uh, run out of time, yes. maybe we can close it and uh, the delegates and uh, delegates can ask the speakers uh, questions on probably LinkedIn directly. If that's okay with uh, you and Ivan, we can close it now. Sure, okay. Uh, Dr. Ivan, uh, is there anything uh, you'd like to say before we close the session? Uh, no, thank you. So I think it was a great session with uh, great speakers and experts in the field. And thank you very much, Amir, uh, for organizing and uh, inviting all of us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all your time today. And we will be in touch uh, with uh, future upcoming events relating to smart cities uh, and AI. Uh, uh, and um, uh, thank you to all of our delegates as well for joining and all for, the, and for all the questions today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference sessions coming up. So thank you, everyone, again. Thank you so much, Dr. Ivan, uh, Faisal, Sumit, John. Thank you all. Thank you all. It was wonderful to be here. Wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumit.